In a galaxy far, far away, a saga continued that captured the hearts and imaginations of audiences worldwide. As we venture back into the cosmic tapestry of Star Wars, we find ourselves delving into the intricate world of Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. A tale of romance, political intrigue, and epic battles that set the stage for the legendary events to come. Join us as we unravel 107 fascinating facts about this iconic installment in the Star Wars series, where secrets will be revealed and the true depth of George Lucas's vision comes to light. So grab your lightsabers and prepare to be immersed in the world of the Jedi, Sith, and the complex web of characters that make this chapter truly remarkable. Welcome to Cinematica, your new home for all things movies and TV. From Doctor Who to Harry Potter, we'll be going through all your favorites and favorites you didn't even know you had. Before we begin, we publish new videos every week. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second, and it helps us a ton here at Cinematica. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Number 1. Attack of the Clones is the second installment in the prequel trilogy, a narrative that precedes the original Star Wars trilogy created by George Lucas. Number 2. Lucas, the mastermind behind the Star Wars franchise, took on the roles of director and screenwriter for this installment. Number 3. Lucas directed the original Star Wars, retroactively titled Episode 4 A New Hope, but did not direct the sequels Episodes 5 and 6. He returned to the director's chair for the prequels, directing all three. Number 4. The movie marked a significant technological milestone as it was one of the first feature films to be shot entirely digitally, paving the way for a new era in the film industry. Number 5. George Lucas partnered with Sony and Panavision to create cameras capable of filming an entire movie, allowing for more creativity and streamlined filming and editing processes. Number 6. Even though the film was shot digitally, film reels were still sent to movie theaters to be played on their projectors. The cans containing the reels were shipped under the codename Cueball. Number 7. The film was released on May 16, 2002, a date carefully chosen to be close to the anniversary of the release of the original Star Wars movie, which debuted on May 25, 1977. Number 8. The title Attack of the Clones refers to the clone troopers of the Army of the Republic, which later became the enemy Imperial Stormtroopers during the Galactic Civil War. The title may also hint at a more discreet clone attack that is not explicitly revealed in the movie. Number 9. The character of Count Dooku, portrayed by the legendary Christopher Lee, was introduced in this episode, adding a new layer of complexity and intrigue to the unfolding narrative. Number 10. The film had a substantial budget, with an estimated cost of $115 million, showcasing the grand scale of production and the extensive use of groundbreaking special effects. Number 11. The movie was a commercial success, grossing over $649 million worldwide. Number 12. The character of Jango Fett, portrayed by Tamora Morrison, serves as the genetic template for the clone army, a critical element in the unfolding narrative of the Star Wars saga. Number 13. The film explores the early relationship between Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala, laying the foundation for a love story that would have significant implications for the entire series. Number 14. Ewan McGregor reprised his role as Obi-Wan Kenobi, offering viewers a deeper insight into the character's journey and his mentorship of Anakin Skywalker. Number 15. The movie features a memorable and intense battle scene in the Geonosis Arena, where the Jedi Knights face off against a host of adversaries, showcasing their combat skills and unity. Number 16. Ki Adimundi's lightsaber changes colors multiple times during the arena battle. When he first shows up, it's blue. Then when Yoda arrives, it's green. Then when Adimundi gets on a ship, his lightsaber is once again blue. Number 17. For whatever reason, Jango Fett's guns sound different in the arena than anywhere else in the movie. Number 18. The film's score was composed by the legendary John Williams, who skillfully blended new musical themes with established motifs from the original trilogy, creating a rich and immersive auditory experience. Number 19. Williams underscores Anakin's dark turn with the inclusion of the Emperor's theme to reflect Palpatine's corruption of Anakin's soul, which then transitions to the Imperial March, signaling Anakin's impending transformation into Darth Vader. Number 20. 
In a nod to a famous goof from episode 4, where a stormtrooper accidentally bangs his head on a door, Jango Fett repeats this action when he gets onto his ship after his fight with Obi-Wan. Ouch. Number 21. The aggressive negotiations conversation during the dinner scene between Anakin and Padme was ad-libbed by Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman at George Lucas' request, as he was not satisfied with the romantic dialogue he initially wrote for the scene. Number 22. Anakin accidentally clips through a barrier while visiting the Geonosian factories. Padme ducks her head through a digitally created door, but Anakin does not, and his head just drifts right through. Number 23. Hayden Christensen, who portrayed Anakin Skywalker, greatly enjoyed filming the bar scene because it was a real set, not just a green screen, providing a tangible environment for the actors. I wonder if any of the beverages were real. Number 24. Like Ewan McGregor in Episode 1, Hayden Christensen made lightsaber noises the first time he was handed one during rehearsal. This moment caused George Lucas to chuckle, and he then informed Christensen that sound effects would be added during post-production. Number 25. According to George Lucas, Obi-Wan's tactics of hiding in the Geonosis asteroid field teaches the young Boba Fett a valuable lesson, a strategy he later uses to his advantage in adulthood to find Han Solo in Episode 5. Number 26. Anthony Daniels, best known for playing C-3PO, made a cameo as a human customer in the bar scene where Anakin and Obi-Wan chase Senator Amidala's attempted assassin. Number 27. Ahmed Best, aka Jar Jar Binks, also made a cameo in the bar scene. Thankfully, the buffoonery and comic antics were kept to a minimum. Number 28. Also visible in the bar's crowd are R2-D2 handler Don Bees and his droid team. Number 29. One more quick bar fact. Obi-Wan says that Anakin will be the death of him. How right he was. The feeling you're going to be the death of me. Don't say that, Master. This foreshadows, or aftershadows, I guess, the fact that Anakin as Darth Vader kills Obi-Wan in A New Hope. Number 30. After the negative response to The Phantom Menace, George Lucas reportedly had trouble writing the script for Attack of the Clones. He completed the first draft in March 2000, just three months before filming was set to commence. Number 31. To help finish the script, Lucas hired writer Jonathan Hales, whom he had worked with previously. The final draft was given to the cast and crew only one week before filming started. Number 32. The boy band in Sync filmed a cameo for the movie, where members, excluding Justin Timberlake and Lance Bass, were dressed as Jedi and appeared in the background of a scene with Obi-Wan and Master Yoda. However, the scene was cut, possibly due to the backlash received after news of their cameo leaked. Number 33. Despite the negative feedback about the character Jar Jar Binks from The Phantom Menace, George Lucas defended the character, attributing the dislike to a rejection of humor by the fans. Number 34. George Lucas pranked the cast and crew by releasing a second draft of the script with the working title, Episode 2, Jar Jar's Big Adventure. Personally, I think that would have done even better at the box office. Number 35. Tamora Morrison, who portrayed Django Fett, was asked to fly nearly 8,000 miles from New Zealand to England for reshoots, where he filmed only one shot and one line. Worth it. Number 36. More than 400 actors were screen tested for the role of grown Anakin Skywalker. Notable actors considered for the role included Paul Walker, Colin Hanks, Ryan Philippe, Christian Bale, and Heath Ledger. Number 37. Hayden Christensen landed the role of Anakin due to his chemistry with co-star Natalie Portman, and Lucas' preference for their on-screen appearance together. Number 38. Every clone trooper in the film was computer-generated, with only a few trooper helmets created for some motion capture footage, but no physical trooper uniforms were ever created for the film. Number 39. The Jedi Archive scene features busts of several real-world individuals, including George Lucas and members of the film's animation and visual effects teams. Number 40. Attack of the Clones introduced fans to a fully CGI version of Master Yoda for the first time, with meticulous attention to replicating the puppet's movements. Number 41. Lucas insisted that the animation department replicate Frank Oz's puppeteering style down to the smallest detail, including the jiggling of Yoda's ears with every head movement. Number 42. The original concept art for Count Dooku depicted a darker female character to contrast with Padme. 
This concept changed when Christopher Lee joined the project, but the art later inspired the character Asajj Ventress in the Clone Wars animated series. Number 43 the pilot clone trooper's helmet displays the number 1138 in tiny LED lights during a scene with Mace Windu in the final battle, a reference to George Lucas's first feature film, THX 1138, a tradition carried throughout the Star Wars universe. Number 44 Film critic Roger Ebert gave Attack of the Clones a two-star review, his lowest ever rating for a live-action Star Wars movie, citing a lack of quotable dialogue and diminished impact of the visual imagery. Number 45. The Jedi Archive Room in the movie closely resembles the famous Long Room at Trinity College Dublin Library. With similar architectural features such as the barrel vault ceiling, double height bookshelves, and busts lining the aisles. Number 46. These similarities led to considerations of legal action by Trinity. If I were them, I'd be honored. Number 47. Samuel L. Jackson, who portrayed Mace Windu, requested a purple lightsaber for his character, a deviation from the traditional blue or green lightsabers of the Jedi. This request was granted by Lucas, making Windu the only live-action character to wield a purple blade. Number 48. The hilt of Windu's saber has the letters BMF engraved on it, a personal touch added by the production crew. Fans of Pulp Fiction will recognize that one right away, but I'm not repeating the meaning here just in case YouTube decides to demonetize the video. Number 49. The BMF engraving is not visible in the movies, which is probably for the best. Number 50. George Lucas's children, Katie, Amanda, and Jet Lucas made cameos in the movie. Number 51. Lucas's daughters appeared as patrons at the Outlander Club, and Jet portrays a Jedi Padawan in the archives. Number 52. Jet later makes a cameo in Revenge of the Sith as a young Jedi defending Bail Organa. Number 53. After making Attack of the Clones, Ewan McGregor appeared in the movie Black Hawk Down, which required him to be clean shaved and to have an extremely close buzz cut. New scenes with Obi-Wan Kenobi were then added to the film in post-production. Since McGregor had not had enough time to regrow his hair or a full beard, he had to be fitted with a hairpiece and a prosthetic beard, which is often easily distinguished from his natural hair as it appears in the rest of the film. Number 54. Scenes where you can see this fake hair include the conversation between Obi-Wan and Anakin in the elevator, the exchange concerning the Changeling in the Outlander Club, the Jedi Temple talk between Obi-Wan, Mace Windu, and Yoda, and his interrogation by Count Dooku. Number 55. Attack of the Clones was the final Star Wars movie released on VHS in the United States, marking the end of an era as DVD became the dominant format. Number 56. The VHS release of the movie included exclusive content such as a featurette titled Star Wars Connections with C-3PO and R2-D2 that recapped the entire saga up to that point. Number 57. Anakin's reunion with his mother, Shmi, was part of Palpatine's manipulations. This plot point was meant to be revealed in Revenge of the Sith, but was removed. Number 58. According to Star Wars canon, the Tusken Raiders who kidnapped Shmi Skywalker were paid to do so by Count Dooku. Dooku had done this on orders from his master, Darth Sidious. Number 59. When Anakin is slaughtering the Tusken Raiders, Qui-Gon's voice can be heard in the background. This is no accident. According to Star Wars canon, Qui-Gon's Force Ghost tried to stop Anakin's rage, but failed. Number 60. The massacre of the Tusken Raiders becomes part of Tusken folklore as kind of a demonic figure, as suggested in the Star Wars Legends novel Tatooine Ghosts. Number 61. Just before Anakin goes to search for his mother on Tatooine, he has a conversation with Senator Amidala. The camera pans to their shadows as they talk, and Anakin's resembles that of Darth Vader. According to the DVD commentary, the Vader-like shadow that Anakin casts was not a special effect, but a coincidence. Number 62. Senator Amidala is a great shot. She almost never misses. This is a reference to her daughter Leia, who also almost never misses. Number 63. During rehearsals and filming of Count Dooku's lightsaber battle scenes, a small model of Yoda was used as a reference point for Christopher Lee. The model, however, was slightly altered to have vampire fangs, to which Lee's amused response was, I will not comment on that, I didn't think you would do this to me, George. 
The fangs were likely a joke at Lee's expense for his performance as Count Dracula in 1958's Dracula, and several other Hammer Studios horror films. Number 64. The Senate votes to give the Supreme Chancellor sweeping emergency powers to go to war against the separatist forces. This is the same ploy Adolf Hitler used to gain similar dictatorial power in mid-1930s Germany. Number 65. A number of subtle visual clues were incorporated into the design of the shots to help audiences keep track of who's who. The good guys, the Republic clone troopers always move from screen right to screen left, while the separatist battle droids moved from screen left to screen right. Number 66. Another visual cue involves a gigantic star. The sun is behind the clones, resulting in a gloomier sky behind the separatists. Number 67. Finally, the missile contrails were color-coded to denote allegiance. The Republic rockets leave clean white trails, while the villains launch missiles that leave noxious black-slash-purplish exhaust. Number 68. The fight between Yoda and Dooku was originally envisioned quite differently. Yoda was supposed to come in and immediately have the fight with Dooku, but much of the creative team felt that it was too quick a transition for Yoda, and the audience needed to feel the power of good and evil going against each other. Number 69. The duel between Yoda and Dooku, who was once Yoda's apprentice, goes through three phases. Using the Force to launch and deflect projectiles, Sith lightning, and a lightsaber duel. Yoda reveals his lightsaber for the first time, showcasing his skills in combat. The duel ends with Yoda showing empathy by saving others, highlighting the difference between the Jedi and Sith philosophies. Number 70. There was also footage shot of Dooku using either Obi-Wan's or Anakin's lightsaber in addition to his own against Yoda, but these moves did not make the final cut. Number 71. This is the only Star Wars movie where the camera shot tilts up after the opening scroll to start the scene. In all other Star Wars movies, the camera shot tilts down after the scroll. Number 72. Dex's backstory was that he was a former mercenary and explorer. He and Obi-Wan had served together on a couple of missions, forging a bond that is evident in their camaraderie on screen. Number 73. The character Ayla Sakura, played by Amy Allen, was not created by George Lucas. Sakura first appeared in the 19th issue of the Dark Horse Comics Star Wars Republic series, part one of Star Wars Twilight. Lucas was so impressed with the character that he decided to have her in the film. Number 74. When Watto is seen on Tatooine, flies are buzzing around him. The crew had recorded sound effects of flies buzzing around the horse dung at Skywalker Ranch, and they were happy to finally be able to use the sound that they recorded. Who knew horse dung could be so exciting? Number 75. The death sticks that the pusher tries to sell Obi-Wan were a hallucinogenic drug, and their name is an obvious reference to cigarettes. According to Lucas, much like with cigarettes, with each dose, the user's life was shortened, and the successive dosages took away larger chunks of their lifespan, and with each successive dose, the desire for a harder reaction increased. Lucas inserted this personally into the film because of his strict views concerning smoking. Number 76. To efficiently deliver a realistic explosion for the gunship that gets shot out of the sky, ILM built a mandrill of the vessel. A mandrill is an all-blue practical miniature. It was rigged with pyrotechnics and blown up. The properly shaped explosion was digitally extracted, interacting with the properly shaped wreckage, and digital artists replaced the blue gunship with the computer-generated one. Number 77. The assassination attempt on Padme Amidala at the beginning of the movie parallels real-world historical events. It resembles the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which sparked World War I and the burning of the German Reichstag in 1933, which Adolf Hitler used to seize absolute control of Germany. Number 78. The assassination attempt on Padme was carried out by a chain of individuals, the assassins Zam Wessel and Django Fett, who were working for Count Dooku, who in turn was working for Darth Sidious. This complex conspiracy is presented as a mystery that unfolds throughout the film. Number 79. Dooku was once a Jedi Master who had Qui-Gon Jinn as his apprentice and Yoda as his master. He left the Jedi Order to reclaim his birthright as Count of Sereno. Number 80. During his exile, Dooku was approached by Sidious who offered to help him attain more power and rid corruption from the Republic. However, Dooku was merely a tool for Sidious to further his own agenda. Number 81. 
Early in the movie, Palpatine tests Yoda's perception abilities under the guise of seeking counsel, to gauge the Jedi High Council's awareness of his schemes. Number 82. Later in the film, it's shown that the Jedi have grown weaker in their ability to perceive the dark side of the Force. Number 83. The Jedi's naivete is further highlighted in their defense of Count Dooku, as they believe he is a political idealist and not a murderer. This belief in the incorruptible character of the Jedi foreshadows Mace Windu's blind spot to Anakin's upcoming turn to the dark side. Number 84. Palpatine manipulates the situation by recommending Padme receive Jedi bodyguards, knowing that Obi-Wan would be accompanied by his apprentice Anakin. This move was intended to distract Padme, a vocal opponent to his army plan, and to distract Anakin, whom he plans to corrupt. Number 85. The romance between Anakin and Padme might have been orchestrated by Palpatine as a form of Sith brainwashing to trap her into a vulnerable position. This theory stems from the seemingly forced nature of their romance. Number 86. George Lucas tried to model the romance between Anakin and Padme on the film Dr. Zivago, even having the Attack on the Clones poster modeled on a Dr. Zivago poster. Both depict forbidden loves between figures who pose as refugees and run away to country retreats. Number 87. However, the romance in Attack of the Clones is criticized for not having the depth and moral complexity that is seen in Dr. Zivago. Number 88. Anakin Skywalker does not make a good first impression in the movie, displaying a bad attitude in his early interactions with Padme. His behavior includes insulting, belittling, and making her uncomfortable, which casts a shadow over their ensuing romance. Number 89. The chase scene with Zam Wessel features a nod to Episode 4, with animators sneaking in three TIE fighters pursuing an X-Wing in the bottom left corner of the screen, foreshadowing Luke's trench run in the original movie. Number 90. In Palpatine's office, there are statues representing the four stages of Duarte philosophers and lawgivers from the early days of the Republic. Palpatine takes particular interest in the hooded figure Sistros, in which he later hides a Sith lightsaber. Number 91. On Naboo, you can see what looks like the Millennium Falcon, but these are actually generic YT-1300 freighters. Number 92. The actual Falcon does make a cameo in Episode 3, though. Number 93. R2-D2's ability to ascend stairs but not descend them is highlighted in the movie. This ability was later justified in many fans' headcanon by R2 using his boosters, which are revealed later in the film. Number 94. The Kaminoans had originally been building a clone army at the orders of Jedi Master sifo Dyas. Originally, this character was supposed to be an alias for Darth Sidious, but a typo in George Lucas's script turned it into that name, prompting Lucas to develop a backstory for this new Jedi character. Number 95. sifo Dyas's backstory was later expanded upon in an episode of The Clone Wars. Number 96. The clones were cloned from bounty hunter Jango Fett, who was raising one of the clones, Boba Fett, as his son. Number 97. Jango's armor is Mandalorian, a design derived from the people of Mandalore who brought him in as a foundling. Number 98. The clone trooper armor is also derived from the Mandalorian design. Number 99. In the background of the garage where Anakin confesses his act to Padme, you can spot Luke's land speeder from A New Hope and an early version of the T-16 Skyhopper that Luke flies in the original trilogy. Number 100. As Dooku flees, he reveals the preliminary blueprints for the Death Star. Due to the early construction of the Death Star in Geonosis, the Geonosians were exterminated via sterilization ordered by the Emperor, leaving only one survivor named Click Clack. Number 101. During the confrontation with Dooku, blue and red light flashes across Anakin's face signaling the moral tug of war between good and evil within him. This scene foreshadows Anakin's gradual loss of humanity as he succumbs to the dark side of the Force. Number 102. The movie ends with Sidious, aka Palpatine, overseeing the clone army, a scene that is set to the Imperial March, hinting at the rise of the Empire. The conflict between the Republic and the Separatists is orchestrated and manipulated by Palpatine, who plays both sides to further his own agenda. Number 103. The secret wedding of Anakin and Padme is visually similar to the final shot of The Emperor Strikes Back, with Anakin and Padme framed alongside R2-D2 and C-3PO, just like Luke and Leia were in the original trilogy. Number 104. 
During the wedding scene, as Anakin's cybernetic hand holds Padme's, the soundtrack includes a soft heartbeat sound, hinting at the future birth of Luke and Leia. This detail, although subtle, serves to connect the prequels to the original trilogy and foreshadows the central role that the Skywalker siblings will play. Number 105. Attack of the Clones was nominated for an Oscar for Best Visual Effects at the 2003 Academy Awards. The eventual winner was Lord of the Rings The Two Towers. Hard to believe that these famous sequels were released in the same year. Number 106. This was the most expensive Star Wars film ever when it was released. The estimated budget clocked in at around 120 million. The Clone Wars kept that title until The Force Awakens in 2015, which cost around 200 million. Number 107. Many people consider this to be the weakest entry in the Star Wars prequel trilogy, which would have made it the weakest Star Wars overall. These days, folks seem to be more angry at the sequel trilogy, though. Let us know what you think about this down in the comments. We've ventured through the intricate tapestry of Episode 2. From the dark manipulations of Palpatine to the blossoming yet doomed romance of Anakin and Padme, we uncovered secrets and details that breathe life into this chapter of the Star Wars saga. As we leave the realms of conspiracy and warfare, remember, the Force will be with you always. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. Did you enjoy our list? What facts do you think we missed? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, like and subscribe to see more great videos every week. And remember, Frederator loves you.